Well, I think we may still have a few people coming in, but um, I'll go ahead and get us started. So everybody, welcome. I'm really excited um, and I hope you are too, to hear more about RxR Realty and um, from our speakers. So Neil, in a little bit, will get us started um, with an introduction of Mr. Elder and um, what he's done. But I think just for today, so you know who I am, I am um, a senior marketing student. My name is Abigail Snyder. Um, and I'm really excited just to kind of hear more about this presentation. So for some housekeeping details, uh, I guess if you guys will keep your mics on mute just for the, the duration of the presentation. Um, and then as I guess you have questions, um, I think Bill said you'd be welcome to chime in along the way. Um, we ask that if you, if you do um, ask a question, maybe just give your name, your major. Um, we wanna make this kind of as lively as possible. Uh, since we can't be in person, but um, and I think at the end we will leave some room for for questions um, and get to hear more about that. So Neil, I'll let you take it from here. Hey everyone, I'm Neil Sharma. I'm a fourth year finance international business major, and I'm super excited to introduce our speaker today, Bill Elder. Bill is a managing director of RxR's New York City division and an executive vice president of RxR Realty. Bill is responsible for the oversight and management of the company's New York City office portfolio. When RxR decided to return to New York City in 2010, they tapped Bill to help it reestablish a local operating platform and seek additional investments in Manhattan with his broad market knowledge and acumen. Since joining the firm, he has helped steer RxR on an aggressive post-recession acquisition and expansion, including the iconic Star at Lehigh Building in West Chelsea and one of Manhattan's largest 10, 10 largest office buildings housing some 5,000 employees in 2.5 million square feet. Other strategic acquisitions of statement properties followed, including 450 Lexington Avenue, 237 Park Avenue and 75 Rockefeller Plaza. I'm excited to pass it off to Bill and let him take it away. Oh, thank you. Um, well, look, it's, it's great to be with you. Um, I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this and uh, uh, congratulations for, you know, your focus in, in real estate, interest in real estate. It's a great, uh, it's a great business, great industry. And uh, I've been very fortunate in my career um, to be, uh, you know, as, as uh, well, successful uh, with a lot of help from a lot of people, but just engaged. It's such an engaging uh, industry because, you know, I, I think the way I, I characterize the business to, to people, you can kind of do anything you want within the sphere of real estate. If you want to go into finance, there's great opportunities in finance. If you want to go into marketing, there's great opportunities in marketing. If you want to be an accountant, there's great opportunities to do that. Property management, um, and, and that list is growing now, which is now including technology, placemaking, you know, urban planning. It's all kind of different, uh, just with the advent of, uh, real estate kind of being one of the last sophisticated businesses, mostly brick and mortar kind of, uh, uh approach to really be a, a adaptive to the, to the new technology. So we're on all social media platforms, you know, as far as our marketing and outreach goes. So. And it's an exciting time to, uh, to to get into the career, so I highly recommend it. And um, I would tell you if I can be of uh, help to you as you go through your search of you know what you want to do in life and real estate, whatever. Please uh, reach out. I'm happy to be a resource uh, to you all. Um, so as we go through this, um, I'd, I'd rather keep this as interactive as possible. So if uh, if you see something or if I say something and you want. Uh, further explanation or you want to talk about it just stop stop us or stop me and we'll talk about it all right so with that uh, and just to go back that's uh, that's 230 Park Avenue also known as the Helmsley building so this is one of our iconic uh, asset purchases that we did uh, it's about five years ago now so we've gone through who I am I go by Bill not William certainly not Mr. Elder and I'll give you an overview of the company so, um, like a lot of businesses, uh, Rex and Associates, which is the precursor to RxR, was a family business. So my partner, Scott, who uh, is our CEO, um, his, his uh, grandfather invented uh, and patented the uh, aluminum beach chair. Swear to God, right? So that up until that point, they were wood, heavy, difficult to you know, kind of move around. So, um, and with that came great success and uh, the start of a, of a real estate empire because you need an office, you need manufacturing, you need warehouse, you need distribution. And so the company's origins were founded around that business. Um, fast forward, uh, 1995, company went public, Rex and Associate, 
uh, the family split the company up into kind of two divisions. There was industrial uh, warehouse and then commercial. Scott took over the commercial division. Uh, we were public from 1995 to 2007, uh, where we sold uh, the company, the entire company to SL Green for $6 billion uh, and 700% total shareholder, shareholder return. Uh, what's interesting about 2007 is just the vision, and I'll come back to the vision throughout this whole uh, discussion Scott had about where the markets were, our inability to really um, create more value for the company in its current state, uh, the competitive nature for buying further assets at huge prices. And so this was the point in time that we said, uh, hey, this is probably the right strategy to move on. I will tell you, good day at the bank for a lot of us, but bad day for me because it was the end of, uh, of a great uh, career with some you know, some of my partners here who uh, you know had great relationships with. Uh, I went to SL Green uh, to integrate the company, uh, but couldn't wait to get back. So um, three of the guys bought back some suburban assets. I didn't really want to do that. Green wanted me to come and integrate. So uh, good career choice, but uh, I you know. You, you're going to make a journey in life here, so just kind of pay attention to uh, the right things to do um, to enhance your career. That was definitely a moment that uh, enhanced my career. Uh, but I rejoined the company in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, and I will tell you, we uh, have been on a uh, and privileged and an honor to be part of such a thing uh, on a, uh, a a path to great uh, great things I never anticipated. Um, so great news. Basically, I was the only guy that left on the management team. So coming back was great. Uh, great friendship, smart people. Uh, so um, I've been very, very lucky to have a, uh, you know, from a work experience, when I come to work, I like being here. Um, somebody on the, uh, the, uh, on the, on the chat here uh, happens to be related to me and she'll tell you I'm not home a lot. Um, but I enjoy being I, I enjoy being here. Sorry, Eliza. Uh, but you know, hard work, long hours. It's just kind of part of the drill. Um, let's see. I'm trying to keep this interesting and moving on here. But uh, so I guess we went on our acquisition spree. We acquired about 20 million feet of, uh, of assets between 2010 to today. But as I mentioned, when we were kind of starting out. Real estate's really changed. Um, it, it became a, uh, a almost a, a combination of hospitality, technology, um, you know, real service. People started looking for amenities. Um, I'd say probably four years ago, the shift started to occur where, you know, prior days, and I've been doing this 30 years now, um, you, you just delivered the real estate and expected people to pay their rent. Um, now, you know, within the last four or five years, People want amenities that they don't necessarily want to pay for. They want engagement for their employees. So you really have to cater to the modern kind of tenant demand, which I think we've done pretty well. We'll get into some of the things that we've done in a second here, but um, we, we like to have a kind of a physical digital explanation of our company. Um, you know, we've, we've actually developed an app, which started out kind of as a COVID related app uh, that will probably uh, transition to have a, a long life beyond that. But, the amenities and programming um, that we deliver to all of our assets um, is, is pretty extraordinary and takes a whole team of people to do it. Um, so I think, you know, the last bullet here, future of the industry providing real estate, not as an asset, but as a service is really true. And as we go through, you know, years to come, that's going to be an important theme to kind of think about. Um, so who is RXR? So we focus primarily, almost entirely, on the New York metropolitan area. So all our investments are uh, in the New York region. I'd say, you know, we, we have done some very small investments outside of the region, but uh, we, we stay right here. Uh, right now, we've got about a $20.1 billion uh, valuation, uh, 26 million feet, um, and then uh, 8 million feet of in-progress uh, or near-term uh, uh, residential. Uh, 500 people strong. Um, when I came back, um, I think we had 160, 180. So the growth here has been phenomenal. As I said before, 
there's people in leasing, there's people in marketing, there's people in hospitality management, amenity management. So what used to be accountants and property managers, et cetera, is really grown into so many other um, uh, disciplines. And I'd say that our marketing uh, group here, probably 10, 12 people strong, just given the diverse, uh, the diverse products that, uh, that we have. We do things a little differently. Um, you know, if you study real estate companies, you look at like a, and these are our competitors and our friends, but like an SL Green or a Vernado or whatever, um, they're a little different in their approach. Um, we like collab collaborating with people. We don't like vulture investing. We like, you know, people have problems from time to time. We come in, um, you know, we see opportunities for sure, but we're not trying to, you know, kind of blow people out of situations. We try to help them get the building back on their feet collaborate and you know with that comes a return on a risk adjusted basis that's higher than you know just going in and buying kind of core real estate but we, we try to play nice in the sandbox and i'll tell you is it just as a general theme the deal flow that we've gotten from situations that are you know other firms might look as you know in a vulture kind of a way uh has driven uh, phenomenal uh transactions to us um when they're not going to go to other places and so in times of distress or dislocation, which we're having right now, kind of important to remember, you can't just shift fundamentally overnight. You gotta have a long track record um, of doing that. And so, you know, yeah, we probably left a couple of bucks on the table for some of these things, but when you look at the big picture, um, you know, we feel better about ourselves, but um, we also are gonna see better deal flow going forward. Uh, we're collaborative internally as well. So all of our different departments, um, there's no office politics. If you plan politics, you're out. We don't tolerate it. And, uh, we try to have a really nurturing, collaborative, uh, fun, uh, and energetic, uh, kind of place to come to work because we're here for a long time. And so all that other nonsense can't, can't put up with it. And, you know, at the end of the day, between kind of outward and inward, they're win-wins, right? You feel better about yourself. People feel better about coming to work and you're putting in a 10, 12 hour day, you know, it's, you don't want to come, you don't want to come into the office and be uh, stressed out or not looking forward to it. So, you know, that's when you're looking for your first, uh, first opportunities, think about that. And I know it's hard um, because, you know, you want them maybe more than they want you, or maybe the other way around. But just when you have choices, think about, is this the kind of place I'd want to work? Because um, it's important. Um, and then we talk about kind of the approach on our, our development and redevelopment. Everything's got a story. So when we go out and look at uh, look at opportunities, um, we go out in kind of a collaborative way. We've got an investments uh, group, we've got a, a property management group, uh, our leasing group. So we'll go out, we'll look at an asset, and kind of develop a business plan around it uh, that uh, gets refined. Uh, and I'm, I've got some slides at the end here. We can talk about kind of the, the total process, but um, you know, but it kind of starts with. If you can't lease it, you shouldn't buy it. And what do you have to do to lease it? And so those groups come together to kind of formulate a plan around uh, making it a better leasable opportunity. So um, a lot of work goes into this stuff. When you're buying a billion dollar asset, <laughs> you, better, you better be right. Uh, this is just a little slide on, uh, you know, fifth largest landlord in New York City, uh, 18 and a half million feet. I can tell you this is a proud slide for me because so many of us had such a, well, we all had a hand in doing this, but when you get from where we were in 2010, which was like two pages away from, you know, the top five, um, and we get to five, it's a, kind of a testament to the success and, and journey and diligence and hard work. So, um, you know, a lot of people involved in making this happen, but, uh, you know, we, we, we see a lot more opportunities because we're so large uh, and it's helpful. And here's kind of geographically where the, the portfolio is. You can see mostly dominated by Manhattan. And in Manhattan, mostly uh, commercial office properties. And then you go out to the, uh, to the, the boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, two commercial assets in Queens, but uh, we do have some residential in Brooklyn. And here they all are right here, some of the more dominant ones. So these are, every, every building's got a story. Um, I would say that their uh, competition for tenants is probably uh, a couple that have some spillover, but every, every building's got a different story, a different geographic location, and it's not by accident. You know, you kind of take a holistic approach to this when you're going through and looking, is this additive to the portfolio or not? Um, 
you know, some of these buildings, it, it's, you know, it, if you decide you want to go into the real estate career, these things become your children. And so the good news for us is that we're not really merchant uh, owner developers, meaning we don't buy and quickly sell. Uh, we hold on to these buildings. So mo most of, uh, let's see, I think most of these are coming up on somewhere between five and 10 year holds. Uh, and we haven't sold anything that we bought. Uh, and how we kind of make our, uh, our promote, which is the um, uh, kind of the, the, the equity uh, realization. I, I don't know if you're studying this yet in school. We can get into that if you want to. But um, where our partners, ourselves, our uh, co-investors make money, you want to monetize the asset either through financing or bringing in a, a new uh, uh, co-investor, joint venture, to take people out so you can realize some equity returns which is how we've done it here uh, through both means, both refinancings and, uh, and recapitalizations. And uh, this is more of our kind of residential portfolio. So you can see, uh, you know, five years ago, this didn't exist. Once again, Scott Reckler, visionary, saw Manhattan getting way too expensive for uh, middle income type families and middle income in New York is probably really high income in other parts of the country. Uh, so we started on a, uh, <clears throat> a new path to do uh, for rent uh, residential developments around uh, transportation hubs. So everything you see here uh, is uh, located on or next to <clears throat> rail bus uh, bus lines. So um, people work in the city but have you know nice place to live uh, when they come home. And this has been a huge success. Um, we're trending, uh, and not surprised yet, I'm sure you're all following the news, everybody wanted to move out of New York City and go to suburbs, and so as a result of that, we did pretty well. Um, I wanna see if there's anything here I wanna talk about. Power of local, okay, so power of local, this is, this is good. So because we focus in just one geographic area, uh, we probably have a better, um, ability to transact based on a number of things. We have tremendous political relationships, which in New York are super important when you wanna build, develop, redevelop. Um, the, the political process comes into play through ULIP processes or approval props processes. We have a uh, whole political team here that uh, has a relationship with local government. They know the process. They either came out of the uh, EDC, which is Economic Development Corporation, or some element of uh, of uh, political life uh, that just knows the process. So um, it's uh, it, it's really helpful to have that. And other, others have it as well. But we know who all the owners are, who all the tenants are, who all the financiers are. So when you're, when you're focused in one area, we know all the information, we know what's going on, probably better than anybody. Gives you better ability to uh, execute. Now, a lot of companies do national, international investing. <clears throat> we're probably going to start doing that in the next couple of years, just given the dislocation and distress around the, uh, the world. Uh, we'll stay domestically. Um, but I've always, I've done both. My first 15 year career, I was with a, uh, a national uh, private uh, uh, real estate owner, Shorenstein Company, and uh, I covered a large uh, area of, on the East Coast. Um, and you never really knew if you were getting the whole story in some of these places, like a Charlotte or a Nashville, where the locals, you know, they weren't lying, but uh, you know, it's better to have the full story like what we have in New York. And we know if somebody, you're getting sold a bill of goods no matter what you're buying, right? It's always, hey, buy this, best price. Um, you gotta know what you're buying and understand it so you get the right price. Uh, contractors, unions, those are all important things as well. Unions obviously play a big part in New York uh, for uh, construction uh, and services. So the evolution of RXR, I'll fly through this quickly here. So, you know, like day one, 600,000 square feet of ownership in New York City, 165 employees. We own one building uh, and then we bought 1330. That was kind of set us on the path, uh, 210 to 212, 6.4. This building right here is Star Lehigh. This is one of my favorites. Um, this has a ton of creative, uh, fashion designers, marketing firms, uh, studios uh, where they film commercials and uh, photo shoots, photographers, really super cool, two and a half million feet. Uh, Neil, I think, talked about that building in particular in the introduction. It's a full city block. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, you know, 
six to 8,000 people population. It is one of the coolest, uh, you know, I'm talking about it like a, one of my kids. I mean, it just, this one, uh, which we bought in 2012, this really put us on the path to um, our, our, where we are now. This was, the, this was the building block. This is when everybody wanted it. We got it. Um, so this is where we pause and say relationships are everything in this business and in life. So my 15-year career at Shorenstein, where Doug, the principal, and his father, were like, dear, those people put me on a path to be able to sit here and have a conversation with you all today, um, which I hope you <laughs> Hope you get something out of it. But uh, uh, they own the building. Uh, my next door neighbor runs acquisitions and dispositions for the company. And he was a great colleague and friend. And like we, I literally, in between our two driveways, we were like negotiating the contract. I swear to God. So had it not been for that, there were so many other companies that were competing for this asset. And Doug and, uh, and Mark, who's my neighbor, uh, they wanted us to have it. And so you know, early days, we didn't really have the track record and we kind of didn't have all the money either to buy it, but we figured we'd make it, uh, we'd make it work out. So, uh, I wouldn't say we were over our skis, but, um, you know, they had a lot of risk, um, but this, this one did it. So I'm very proud of that moment. Um, and buildings near and dear to my heart. Uh, 2014, this is when we started doing the, uh, the public private partnerships and the, the residential conversion. Now these were, we're partnering with municipalities that are, you know, tax revenue short. They needed our help. We're coming in. They're giving us an early en entry to, uh, you know, not spending a lot as far as taxes or buying the land. That'll come later because we've got development costs. But uh, they get things out of this, like we'll build a community center, a town hall, um, you know, medical offices, whatever, in return for getting the site, uh, building it, and then do kind of a, a pilot, which is kind of a payment in lieu of real estate taxes for some period of time. So everybody wins. Huge win for everybody. New Rochelle, uh, you know, the, the mayor, great partnership up there. We're, we're thrilled because we made a lot of money. He's thrilled because he got all kinds of things for his constituents. So great, uh, great outcome. Uh, 16 to 20, you know, this is where we're going from, you know, 300 to 500 employees. The company really starts to take form as far as, uh, you know, still buying more assets, doing a little bit more uh, debt and uh, debt uh, investing than, than equity um, and kind of growing our, uh, our internal resources to capture some of that technology uh, that I was talking about before. And so just to, somebody asked the question on uh, what's, what's happening in New York, but I'll, I'll give you kind of the New York story and uh, tell you a little bit about where I think real estate's going generally. But before we start that, any questions or comments or Okay, so um, New York City, 400 million feet of space in New York City. Think about that. If ev every person in the United States, right, represented a square foot, that is the size of the inventory of, of New York City. Massive, right? So we track these statistics very closely, and we've got a whole lot more, but this, this just gives kind of a, a broad overview. So. Um, of that 403,000 feet, now I did this back in uh, September, uh, 403,000 feet, 50,000 of those, uh, 50 million uh, are available. So 16.2% availability rate. It's a lot of space, right? That jumped up like overnight and it is all attributable to COVID, 100%. Uh, just with people putting space in the market, uh, sublease space and so sublease spaces, so we rent it to a tenant and then they rent it to another tenant. Um, and usually it's cheap and compet you know, it, it's more competitive from an economic standpoint than direct space with landlords. So um, that 16.2 uh, between kind of the, uh, the jump, I'm sorry, the 16.2 is the jump year over year in additional space. The uh, total vacancy rate is 12.4%. So that was in, that was in the uh, second week of September today that number is 17%. So it went from 12 to 17%, largely attributable to sublease. And that's gonna go even higher. So um, I've seen this before. I've been through a couple of cycles. This one's different, they all are. Um, it doesn't scare me. Uh, New York's coming back. It's got all the fundamental reasons that it will come back. People wanna be here, uh, metropolitan societies. Things will morph. We'll get into that a little bit, but 
people want to be here. The bioscience is coming. Technology is already here. They're not all going to work from home. And so this will resurrect itself. It may take a couple of years to get through, but uh, New York is going to be just fine. Um, you heard it here first. So um, other than watching the market and seeing what's happening, and, and so, and this kind of, this is where we adjust pricing for our, our kind of available space too. We see this, what used to be a hundred dollar rent might be an $80 rent now. So you've got to really pay attention to this. So what, where's the market going? What are some of the trends? Well, so COVID hit, uh, prior to COVID technology was the big news in town, biotechnology, uh, life science, those life science and biotech, not really here yet, but they're coming, but tech was huge. Uh, we got them all Facebook, Google, and they have millions and millions and millions of feet, Facebook, millions of feet in the city and it's growing. They're out looking for more. So that uh, has done a couple of things. Uh, brought more very smart people who used to work in, you know, kind of West Coast locations here, don't want to leave. But it also did one thing that's really important. So New York was pretty reliant upon uh, financial uh, services uh, in, in prior, uh, you know, prior economies. And when the, you know, financial services went south, the New York market got really uh, damaged. Now, uh, the balance of firms that uh, that make up the 400 million feet, pretty equally dispersed through healthcare. There's always government, every you know city has government. We don't pay as much attention to the government use, but through healthcare, um, tech, and finance. So, you know, technology one day is gonna have a problem. And so, you know, you, you've got a nice balance that it won't all be, uh, the, the entire market goes down because of that, because finance used to be about 65 plus percent of the market uh, prior to the technology uh, coming into the city. Uh, so de-densification, right? So everybody wants to de-densify. COVID's a terrible thing. And up until COVID hit, companies were designing their space for one person per every hundred or so feet. That's really dense. So we think that that probably gets, it probably went too far and it probably gets reversed. How far, don't know, but um, that's one of the topics and there's just not enough data out there yet to really say which way it's going, if it's going anywhere. It may be back to normal, or back to the you know dense pack uh, format. Flight to quality, so that means a couple things. So because the market's kind of you know getting a little slippery here, you can go from a B building to an A building uh, and probably pay the same rent that you might have, uh, you know, for, for what your renewal would have been prior to COVID. Also means we spent a lot of time um, outfitting our buildings and thinking about uh, strategies to make workers feel safe when they came back to uh, came back to, to our buildings and offices. We spent millions of dollars to uh, install uh, uh, thermal sensors to, you know, uh, scan for high temperatures. Uh, we, as I said before, we uh, we built an app, which has uh, I think George is different than New York. We have uh, you're entitled legally to ask five questions of anybody who enters into any commercial area, restaurants included. You know, have you had? Do you have COVID? Have you been exposed to anybody with COVID? Are you? Do you have a sore throat, fever, headache? You know the symptoms of COVID, and you you have to ask answer negative to all those things and then you get a building pass. So it's right on your, right on your phone, you fill it out. Um, but on an, in an anonymized way, we're tracking all the data. So what we're putting into that, so it started out as just kind of building access. Um, now we've got, uh, you can order lunch from dozens of places right on your phone, have it delivered to your office. Uh, we've got uh, environmental uh, uh, features where you can look at the air quality in the building and outside the perimeter of our, our buildings, all accessible. You can see what the population of the total building is. Uh, you can see how many people are in the lobby. So if you don't want to go and be exposed to people, um, you know, it's all very visible. So that means something now, probably won't mean much in six months, a year, I hope. Uh, but the other features that we're embedding into this to make people feel better about their day or have access to uh, keyless entry to their to their offices or to the building, lunches, and, and we'll start delivering some content as well, is gonna be what gets really kind of sticky. We're also doing uh, occupancy sensors in the spaces. So as people are utilizing their space, hey, how come nobody's using that conference room? Maybe we should move people around. So it's kind of a, a predictive uh, 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 
science and, and some of the uh, some of the technologies that's out there right now that uh, kind of tell you how you should be using your space better. Uh, we're heavily involved in that. So technology, huge, huge, huge. Pay attention to it. It's shifting around. I mean, we're. My personal opinion is I think we're in the greatest industrial revolution that's ever occurred in in the history of our, our world. Um, in real estate. There's so much happening on the technology side; it's it's overwhelming. And kind of like 2000s, which you obviously most of you don't remember, which was a big tech boom. Um, there's so much out there; you don't know what's going to be successful or what's going to be successful. You kind of have to test drive it. So, we actually have in our uh, in our um, company we have a uh, a tech uh, a tech group, a lab. We also have a tech investment uh, sector. So we're going out and buying. Uh, almost in kind of a venture format, um, uh, early stage tech uh, tech companies. Uh, Fate of Flex Office Garages. I don't know how familiar you are with companies that you may have heard of, like WeWork, Notel, uh, Regis. Those are, um, you know, one of the one of the more affected uh, one of the more affected groups that's been out, uh, you know, since since COVID. As far as they're a really dense pack. Um, they were providing services probably not very well. Um, just the environment of, of space that they were providing to their end users, um, you know, probably a little scary if you're dealing with COVID. So um, nobody's really re-entered a lot of those flexible office suites. Um, and I think they'll probably not for a while. So uh, I think there'll be a shakeout, you know, maybe one or two will survive, but you know, it's happening right now. So we're watching that. Uh, we have exposure to it. We have uh, WeWork, Convene, Notel, uh, in all of our buildings. So fortunately, not too much. But uh, you know, we're we're in kind of workout situations with all of them. It's kind of a, a not such a great situation. But uh, distributed workforce and satellite offices. Uh, this is the work from home. How many people are going to work from home? Um, I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. I think uh, we're 95% back to the office, and it feels pretty darn good. The mask is the only thing that's not so great, but I'll put up with it because that's kind of what you have to do to stay safe. But uh, I just don't see working from home, even one day a week, I just don't see it as a, as a, as a lasting thing. I don't think it's good for companies. I don't think it's good for the working population. I think if, look, I, the way I look at it is you're a young person, you want to do well, you want to you know show your work, you want to be around management. You're not doing that from home. And so... I think you know it's important and incumbent upon the leaders of all companies to kind of come back to the workplace to inspire people to also come back. I just don't see this being a a, um, a a meaningful shift. Now, I think what will happen is if you're sick, you're going to stay at home and work from home, as opposed to coming in and you got the flu or just a common cold or whatever. Um, I think that'll be the, what the distributed workforce does. And there may be some sections of companies that they're like, look as opposed to expanding, let's just put that division in, uh, you know, work from home environment. And that's not good news if you're in that division, because that means you'll be replaced by AI at some point. So um, that's my personal opinion. I think that's where it's going. But uh, again, don't know. We don't have enough data uh, to really see where that's going. Satellite offices, same thing. Big financial institutions were out looking for, uh, you know, offices that might be close to their workforce's homes, Westchester, New Jersey, whatever to kind of set up uh, set up outside of New York City uh, so people can get into an office and then maybe downsize uh, in their, their their headquarters here in, in the city uh, or they might relocate people around the country to places similar similar thing while it, a lot of people were out looking for it haven't seen it yet so we don't think that that's going to get too much traction proximity to transportation though so this is just people I think the one thing that we've learned nobody wanted the commute was a very, nobody wants to commute, right? So people have extreme commutes where some people commute an hour and a half one way to get to work, right? Some people commute 30 minutes, some people are 10 minutes. But one thing for sure, uh, and all the studies have proven it, the commute part of the day, nobody ever wants to do if they can avoid it. So that's what's kind of slowing down the, you know, people coming back into the workplace. So, you know, your asset being close to uh, uh, transportation is super key, I think, is, you know, the post-COVID um, or, or reasonably close. And, and for residential, too. Um, wellness is huge. So technology and wellness. So what's wellness mean? It means a lot of different things. 
we're actually putting uh, medical offices into a lot of our assets right now uh, through a partnership with uh, Northwell Health, which is the largest hospital system in the New York metropolitan area. And these will do things. This is not like heavy duty, but do, you know, do, do things like you know, wellness checks, flu shots, that kind of thing. Uh, but we're putting them in now. So if you have a positive COVID test um, or want to get a COVID test, you can do it there. And so um, just to stop on that for a second, we're testing once a week here. Um, and uh, I think it's important because it, it gives the whole kind of workforce uh, transparency into, okay, nobody's had a positive test. If there is a positive test, we have a bunch of different ways to um, kind of track uh, contact uh, with anybody who's had it um, to kind of get to the, the, you know, fix it right away. So, um, but that's current wellness. So things like meditation rooms, um, nap rooms, nap pods, not joking, um, and just kind of like physical help where, you know, uh, not necessarily a gym, but maybe curated program, classes, spinning, uh, those are the things you're gonna start seeing, but air quality, air filtration, uh, circadian rhythm lightings in your building lobbies. I mean, these are all the things that you're gonna start seeing and tenants are demanding. And when I say tenants, so there's the actual occupant, the person who works in the, in the space, but then there's the real estate people who make the decisions. So the people who sit in the space wanna know what's going on now, right? And so that's not going away. They also want access to these uh, amenities. Um, and so even programmed amenities, we do things like uh, speaker series where we'll have, uh, we get access to some really phenomenal people. We'll have, you know, best, uh, <clears throat> best new uh, marketing ideas. And we'll bring in somebody from like the head of marketing from Johnson and Johnson, um, you know, to the uh, Ralph Lauren Polo, you know, the, the wide spectrum, but really cool people. And they'll talk about omni-channel uh, retailing and uh, and business and you know technology. That's wellness, right? Because that gives people a sense of being, purpose, um, inspiration, um, satisfying intellectual curiosity. So it's, it's a broad spectrum. But wellness is here to stay, and the people who aren't not paying attention to it are going to be losers in uh, in this game. And then, of course, our political and fiscal issues, which we don't have to get too deep into because I'm sure everybody has a different idea of you know, what, what the uh, outcome they'd all like to see, which is great. Um, but it does have an effect on our general society. So <clears throat> you know, we, we suffered from some uh, political unrest here, uh, which you know, kind of spilled out in the streets of New York, settled down now. Uh, but you know, people are worried about it. Business owners are worried about it. Um, Politicians are worried about it. So, you know, it's just one of these things that people are, get nervous and worried when there's unrest in the streets. Uh, so that needs to get contained. And then the fiscal issues, I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that uh, we're going to have to pay a bill here at the end of the, uh, the COVID uh, period of time and, uh, you know, both on the federal and state level. So, you know, we're watching through to kind of manage that. And the, the reason this is, again, it affects decision making. Um, you know, for New York and all around the country, but particularly in New York. The last thing we want corporate America moving out of here uh, to go to someplace that they feel safer or cheaper or both. So, hold on, sorry. There we go. Um, how are we doing on time? Are we running low? Neil, Abigail, what? How, how are we doing here? So. I think, I think we should be great. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, okay, good, 20 minutes. So <clears throat> that's perfect. Um, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, New York is, is super well poised to navigate the crisis. We talked, we talked about, you know, the, uh, the long-term commitments that have been done here. Facebook, uh, you may have seen this, but for those who didn't, Facebook committed to um, about a million and a half feet of New York uh, real estate in the middle of pandemic. So that's a pretty bold decision, especially from a group that said their entire working population would be able to work from home forever. So as I said before, I'm not buying it. So that just speaks to the fact of why you shouldn't buy it. Uh, and then the diversity. Um, but you know, I think for New York, the one thing for sure, greatest natural resources is talent. People want to be here. They want to live in metropolitan areas. Look, maybe they want to live in suburban areas now, but they still want to come to work in a kind of urban center with, you know, best medicine, best tech, 
best workforce, um, and, and a lot of them, right? A lot of people. So um, it will get through this, and uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, we, we weathered 9 11, we'll weather this for sure. Um, and here's some stuff on just the phys, uh, the, the phys, digital, the phys digital, excuse me, uh, which is the combination of the, uh, the physical and the digital uh, our RX12 uh, kind of product, which is the tech platform. Plus, you, got, you have to have both. You have to have the people and you have to have the technology. So we put in place, we have what's called uh, RxOs, which are uh, RxR experience officers. So they're in probably 50% of our buildings, but they, they cover, they'll cover multiple assets. These are people that are right now uh, highly trained in uh, customer service, but if we have to pull somebody out of a lobby because they had a temperature, uh, it's kind of a concierge kind of a thing. It's like, excuse me, ma'am, sir, can you come with me? You know, so nobody's freaked out. So um, they do that, but but the, the main part of their job is really uh, curating and creating uh, some of that programming I was talking about before. So, you know, games, fitness, uh, speaker series, and so we're doing those online now, um, similar to this, with uh, you know keeping our tenants engaged. So, and we don't charge anything for it right now. So, um, you know, people are actually uh, signing up, and it's pretty pretty going over pretty well. Oh, the investment process. So, <clears throat> then we can open it up to uh, to questions. So, as I said before buying a half a billion dollar billion dollar building or portfolio a lot of effort goes into it the models that we run here uh, very sophisticated um, uh, and uh, you know we, we stress the models uh, you know constantly updating because uh, it's got to be right um, but right now what we're looking for so as I mentioned before there's distress and then there's dislocation so what's what's in real trouble right now a lot of loans are out of balance, right? So there's a lot of loans for sale right now. And again, I, I don't want to get too, um, you know, kind of in the in the, in the weeds here, but uh, the mezzanine debt, which is kind of the, the most at-risk debt, it's kind of the, you know, you've got the A note, which is the Bank of America kind of regular mortgage. But then, you know, the bridge between that and the equity is called mezzanine. It's priced higher from a return standpoint because it's riskier. Because if there's a default, you're next in line, and then you got to cure the defaults, and you know you're dealing with the A lender. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of loans right now, especially in the mezzanine uh, position, that are out of balance and having problems. So uh, you know if you pick up the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times, you'll start to read these these stories, and even the REITs are kind of cleaning their balance sheets up uh, by selling uh, these opportunities, which are trading probably between. 15, 20% two months ago off a of par to maybe 30, 40% off a of par today. So you can see, and the, the level of distress starts to accelerate as you get, you know, kind of closer to people are reluctant to just capitulate. So they hold out, situation gets worse. And so we're starting to see a lot of that. Hospitality res, uh, and retail, you know, no surprise there, right? Hospital, uh, 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 apartments in New York City in big trouble. I think there's a, almost a 20% uh, vacancy rate right now, but hotels decimated, absolutely decimated. So um, we're looking at some opportunities there. Uh, condos, same thing, kind of lopped into the to the, uh, the hospitality and, and residential piece. Uh, some land developments, B and C office, definitely dislocated. And then the dislocation, so dislocation sometimes matures into distress. So class A office, some, all buildings are not alike. So we're starting to see some assets coming for sale. This is when we as a company do well. Um, we love, well, again, we're not vultures, but we love dislocation because you're buying buildings in some you know, hot economies. You're paying a lot. And so I will tell you right now, we have never bought a building we didn't overpay for at the time, right? So if that makes sense. But um, you know, pricing starting to come down and more things are starting to come on uh, the market. So um, hopefully we'll be able to kind of, you know, re-enter and, and start to do a, a nice acquisition uh, period of time to add to our wonderful collection. Multifamily dislocation. Um, industrial logistics, I wouldn't say is dislocated. I'd say it's a mega trend and an opportunity. So um, it probably misplaced on this slide, but, uh, you know, we're doing doing a lot of that. 
And so here's the process. It's uh, so kind of pre-screening of the investment, something will come in either through somebody's got a problem, something's for sale in the market. Sometimes it's something we'll approach somebody with and, you know, hey, we'd be interested in buying 51% for the whole building. So we go pre-screen it, walk the building, go through kind of the whole, um, you know, the physical plant of the building, who's in there, what's it worth, what can we do? Then we take the property tour, usually property tours, five, six, seven people from our side. Sometimes one of our in-house architects will come, <clears throat> one of our in-house uh, contracting people, leasing person, investment person, uh, marketing person. So, um, you know, we do a pretty thorough tour, um, ask a lot of questions, um, and then kind of regroup afterwards to kind of do a debrief on, um, on what we thought. Uh, and then we're formulating the plan, right? What do we want to do with the building? Uh, we're, put differently, we're never buying a building we're not doing something to, right? And so I'd say subtle improvements, probably not either, but uh, most of the things we bought um, have, a, have a, a problem um, or, you know, well, which is an opportunity uh, either in a lease that's expiring, you don't know, you don't know if it's going to be renewed, uh, a big one, right? Which is you buy that building. So I'll give you a quick example, 1285 UBS, uh, million square feet was expiring, uh, within three years after we bought the four years after we bought the building, nobody would buy the building because they didn't have uh, a handle on would UBS stay. So this is where the power local comes in. We knew all the people at UBS. So Scott and I went over and we sat down. We said, hey, we're going to do this. We want to restructure your lease. We actually engaged in a conversation, got the deal done. We closed the building, brought in a billion dollar lender, a balance sheet lender with AIG, brought in a co-investor for half a billion dollars and signed the UBS lease uh, all in one day, which I think was May 15th of 2017. How about that? Um, so then we do the due diligence and uh, underwriting, which is, you know, that's where these models are really complicated. You can't make mistakes in these models. Uh, and we'll go through and then we'll do some up, you know, kind of upside and downside uh, cases. Then we get and kind of negotiate the, uh, the transaction with the seller. Um, but we have an investment committee, which is made up of, uh, I guess, six or seven of us. Uh, Scott and his, Mike Maturo, who's our president, get the final say if there's any, um, but everybody's, um, you know, kind of, and, and they're, they're, everybody's opinion is very respected. And I'll say this, if there's not one dissenter in that process, probably not good because you really want to, you want to get poked. You want to, you, you want to be, oh, I never thought about that. Or, you know, you got to have a dissenter in this process. And so fortunately, there's always a dissenter. Um, usually it's the same person, but uh, that's okay. You need dissension because that makes the, that makes for the process a better process. Then we go and we do the documentation and closing and then we own it. And then we embark on our, on our business plan after that. And so the business plans are kind of rechecked, recalibrated every six months, every year, you know, even while they're being uh, rolled out. And that's the end of this presentation. So I say with that, go dogs beat Kentucky. Sweet. We'll now open it up for questions that anybody has. not Feel free to just unmute your mic and go ahead. I have a question. Um, you were saying how there is like a wide variety of what you can do within real estate. So why did you choose to do management? Like what stood out to you with that and like, like instead of something else? So like, look, my, my, my job is a little unusual because I do a lot of different things to just kind of, so I, I'd say that like my job's not really management. I am a manager of people. I have, you know, a large crew here that, that works with me. Um, but I'd say my, my real job, um, you know, my focus is on, you know, our, our leasing of the assets, right? Um, buying, uh, you know, selling, being kind of a, you know, a, a, one of the, I guess, three or four kind of uh, people who run the company. Um, and there's a lot of people that run the company, so don't, uh, I'm trying to phrase this the right way. But, um, but my focus is making sure that we're keeping our buildings full, we're thinking about things the right way, but that has a lot of kind of sub, uh, 
divisions under it. And also when we buy a building, as I said before, if you can't lease it, you can't buy it or you shouldn't buy it. Um, what caused me to go into this? That's a good question. So um, I would tell you, I don't think there's one of you, and maybe there is one of you, but uh, that probably know what they want to do when they get out of school. You might have an idea, but you haven't done it yet. Um, and it's hard, right? Because you're, you're kind of uniquely unqualified to make that decision since you may not have spent a lot of time in doing the thing you're going to do. So um, I got in real estate. My second job, um, which my first job was about a year, I, through somebody who was a family friend who was uh, uh, the Shorenstein Company was moving to New York. Uh, it was in the beginning of the kind of uh, late 80s, early 90s recession, and she needed somebody she trusted that could, I mean, we're talking about my skill set was zero, but the one skill set I had, and you probably never even know, heard what this is, Lotus 123, which is a precursor to Excel, I was pretty good at that. So, um, you know, I was kind of the analyst on the team, the junior person on the team, and uh, I liked it. And so, uh, you know, that kind of matured into, I was a leasing guy for a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of uh, it, it matured into a whole bunch of different things. So I'd say, Eliza, kind of accidental. Um, but, uh, you know, once I got into it, I was, I really loved it. So, um, but had I known what now, what I, you know, had I known then what I know now, uh, I probably would have approached it vastly differently. I probably ended up doing the same things, but uh, we're starting out the same way. But um, I, I just was not looking for the real estate job. So, which is okay. I mean, that's how you have to, you know, you got to try things out. Don't be afraid to, you know, uh, as, as you're unhappy or you, you know, you think you might want to try marketing or whatever, give it a whirl. We can't hear you, uh, Sarah Beth. We can't. You're 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 unmuted, but no. If you want to put it in the chat, I can ask it for you. Oh yeah. Oh no, we hear you now. Yeah, we, yeah, oh, we can hear you. Can now. you hear me? There you go. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so don't I be sorry. More, <laughs> don't ever be sorry. The management side, but someone who's more on the finance side of real estate, do they ever go out and meet um, people who like? Do they ever go out of the um, business, or are they mainly just focusing on like the numbers and stuff? Like, do they ever meet with people that you're coordinating? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, yes and no. Um, so there are some analysts that will, um, I guess, get more senior and get more responsibility that never get to a level of um, like an investment uh, head of investments or uh, or otherwise um, so you know it's kind of what you make out of it I think it's a usually if you're if you're on that side of the business if you're on the finance side of the business you're probably gonna stay there um, which is a good thing I'm not suggesting it it's not uh, but you may decide you want to go work for a commercial bank in the lending group. You may decide you want to go uh, to a smaller company and, and do smaller acquisitions. Um, I think the one thing I'd say on the finance side of the business and asset management side of the business, you really need to understand the numbers in order to really um, understand uh, real estate in general, right? It, it has a massive spillover effect because, you know, as I said before, if you can't lease it, you shouldn't buy it. But, you know, there, there's implications to everything that you do, which may affect your loan, it may affect a covenant with your partners, it may affect all these things. And the best way to get experience in kind of figuring out what those are so that you know how to kind of run the business. I mean, look, look at what a, a, a commercial asset, a building, is its own business when you think about it, right? It's got its own infrastructure, it's got its own people, it has its own accounting system, and you know, it's got a, it's a kind of a life of, of itself. Um, and, you know, finance is a big part of it. Um, and these are like big businesses and, you know, single assets. So you really need to understand the structure of what you bought, how it works. Um, and uh, so, you know, probably a good place to start, I'd say for sure. And then you can go other places from there. But usually the finance folks um, have a little bit more, and I mean this in, in 
kind of a funny way, more of an elitist attitude towards things. So they're probably not going to go into certain other areas of the of the business, like maybe like a property management, which is a little, um, little, little more, you know, I guess, how do I put it? Uh, less desirable from a, you know, kind of how you might be viewed in the real estate community. If that makes sense. That answer your question. Okay. What else? I have a question for you, Bill. <clears throat> so how's working in real estate after the 08 financial crisis prepared you for this black swan event and how's this crisis different? Um, there, none of these are fun. I can tell you, um, they're, they're really not. Um, it's stressful. You're seeing like economic disaster, friends losing jobs, companies shutting down. Um, and you know, this is where kind of the gray hair comes into all these organizations a little bit. Um, we've been through it enough times, um, and where great partnerships come into it as well. Um, you know, kind of not relaxing, but taking a deep breath and assessing the situation for what it is and being honest about it is the first thing you have to do. And so 08 was such a catastrophe um, where, I mean, Lehman Brothers going out of business, if that doesn't rattle your cage, I mean, nothing will. And so you, you just couldn't believe it. And the market was paralyzed. I mean, just it, it wiped out. Um, the days of the, you know, the, the market just plunging. And so it, it's frightening, but um, there's not a lot you can do to, to stem what's going to happen, right? You're, as a, as a, you know, a property owner or whatever it is you're doing, you're a victim of the circumstance. And so how you navigate it's the best way to kind of approach it, right? So in 08, we did kind of similar to what we did now. Um, a, we got out of our ownership position of, you know, many millions of feet, sold it and recognized gain because we saw something we didn't know was going to be any near what ended up happening. So we had a little less exposure, but that was preparedness, right? Um, but getting a plan, having flexibility to adjust the plan and meet things as it comes was kind of the best way to do it. Now, come fast forwarding, um, to today, so, you know, and, and it, it's not just 08, I think, Neil, to, it's the ones that were even before that, right? Just recognizing, okay, we got a problem, right? And not, not being foolish to think that it's going to go away or it's going to be better or whatever. You've got to grab a hold of yourself and say, this is going to be really bad. So what are we going to do, right? And so that gives you the discipline to have gone through these things a few times. Uh, making sure that as we went along, we didn't leverage these properties to like 90%, which puts you in a bad spot. 50, 40, 50%, you're never losing a building, if, you know, from a, a loan to, to value standpoint. Um, so what we did this time, uh, we established a task force uh, in January uh, to deal with COVID. And so we met weekly, which started to become daily. And um, so, you know, we as an executive team meet once every couple of weeks to talk about, you know, just strategy and other things. This one was serious. It's like, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, got a batten on hatches. Where do we have weakness? Where do we have, you know, stop expenses here? Went through full business plans. We were doing also calculations um, of a, a V-shaped recovery, U-shape, and a hockey stick to kind of plan for how long this is going to be. Uh, we started working on technology platform, building preparedness. I mean, there was a lot going on. And so it started back in January. But once the middle of March hit, um, you know, we were meeting daily um, and then we all went home to do it. And that was a little weird because nobody had ever done that before. So uh, fortunately, we were set up um, once again, Scott, the visionary. It's like we got to make sure everybody's outfitted at home with everything that they need. And this is back in like February. So the IT guys were going through bolstering our IT system so that we could communicate internally because we kind of saw where this is going. Um, and then just conversations with our partners, our lenders, and you know the whole gamut. Um, you got to get in front of it, and so that's kind of how it prepared all of us. And um, and everybody, again, it's everybody brings something different to the table when you're going through this stuff. Um, and you know, in these periods of time, like dissension or negativity is not one of them. So where I said there's always got to be that outlier of somebody poking holes. 
Um, you got to be a little careful in, in something like this where you're poking holes because it's all for one, one for all. I think you test different things a little differently. Like I will tell you, the one fear I had was when we were putting all these, what yesterday would have been a, viewed as intrusive technology uh, into our buildings where we're asking people questions about their, you know, like their health and we're screening their temperature. People, you know, people are going to go crazy. They're not going to go for that. Well, guess what? They went for it because like it's a game of life and death. And so we kind of put it out there to test it a little bit just to make sure there was embrace of it. Not only are they like happy about it, they're paying for it. Right. So, um, but you know, I had to be that guy to ask the question, but you know, again, I want to make sure I, I capitalize on the point. It can't be asked in a negative way. It's got to be like, Hey, are people going to do this? Um, negativity in these periods of time, just not helpful because it's tough enough. Um, but, um, and then, you know, just probably what I learned just going forward, stay super close to your, your customers, our tenants and our partners and our lenders, which we did. And so some of the conversations that came out of that were pretty wild. I mean, on the phone with the head of real estate for Google, uh, Hey, what's going on? What are you guys thinking about? Right. Uh, same with Ernst and Young and, you know, international companies. We had one with one of the largest international uh, advertising uh, groups where we had a person in Frankfurt, we had a person in you know, LA, we had a person and they were just going around sharing, you know, hey, here's what we're thinking about. What are you guys thinking about? So pretty fascinating stuff into our partnership with McKinsey, Microsoft. Um, you know, Microsoft's our partner for this app. Like the, the CEO of Microsoft has given one of these presentations. He's talking about us. He's talking about RxR and Scott Reckler. I mean, I never thought in a million years we'd be in that place, but we are. Uh, so it's pretty cool. So uh, what I'd also say, Neil, is you, what, what comes out of this, we'll probably be, well, I'm not going to say probably, we're going to be a better company coming out of this than we did go, than we were going into this. Um, and again, it's because of the teamwork and the, you know, kind of ingenuity in the fight. Um, so, you know, these things suck. There's no question about it, but um, what comes afterwards and you got to keep your head down. You got to, you know, I never worked more hours and I work like there's almost no more hours to work in the day than I was through the whole COVID thing. Um, but you have to, right? You have to. And so you fight and there will be victims, I assure you. And they're starting to be in the real estate world because they weren't prepared for this. So that won't be us, but good question. Somebody asked something else here on the prepared questions. Um, so you talked about long-term changes. What parts of the company culture are most proud of? This is a good question. So, um, so many things. Um, we've got a diversity uh, kind of initiative here that, uh, you know, up till a year or two ago, it never even occurred to me um, that that would be something that we would have here. So we've got a whole committee on uh, inclusion, diversity, and really promoting it. Um, so I'm really proud of that. I'm also really proud of the work that we do in the communities in which we do business, where uh, some of our charitable work, um, some of our help uh, just through, uh, you know, people looking for COVID relief. We had a whole task force uh, that were uh, on a hotline. You could call and say, I can't fill this paperwork out. And we had people that would do it for them. Uh, so in, in these different communities. So I'm super proud of that. I'm super proud of the, you know, work that people um, do every day here to communicate to, to, you know, kind of combination of uh, all these different departments that make us a better company. Um, really inspirational. So I'm proud of a lot of things, but um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the social things that we've been doing, um, which make a difference. Right. And so up until recently, a lot of companies weren't focused on that. Some of the really big ones were, but um, I'm super proud of that. So um, hope that answered the question. Uh, the next one is the business mistake uh, learned from the most. There's so, there's so many, right? I mean, you, you got to make mistakes. You got to take calculated risk. If you're uh, a mistake, you learn from a mistake that's a positive outcome, I think. Um, and it depends on how big the mistake is. You don't want to lose like a $10 million, you know, uh, take a $10 million hit because you screwed up a number and somebody didn't check it enough. But um, I'd say just thematically, um, probably a couple of times where I could have put my foot a little uh, 
part around the gas pedal to accelerate a situation that I was maybe slow walking a little bit that turned out to kind of not end up so great. Um, so, and I, I think not every single one of those situations you want to step on the gas pedal. Sometimes you got to slow play things, but um, I, I think my radar for some of this has been enhanced by the ones that I should have and didn't um, that, uh, you know, ended up, most of those ended up in a, a better place, but, uh, you know, with some complication. So, um, but again, I think you, you want to, you, you can't be crippled by, oh my God, if I make a mistake, I'm going to, you got to make, you, you have to have good management around you to help you develop as a professional. And if you go in a direction and it doesn't work out the way that you think that it should have or whatever, or it doesn't work out at all, um, as long as, you know, the, the try was worth it and sanctioned and, you know, but you, you made a mistake getting there or whatever, you learned from the mistake. And so we have a whole thing called lessons learned uh, in our company where we kind of keep track of, you know, hey, we did this, we should have done that. So next time let's do that instead. Uh, but but we, we sit down and we actually talk about it. And nobody's like uh, thrown under the bus or, you know, kind of pointed out like, don't you do that, you know, because these are not, these are, they're not mistakes. They're just, we should have done something differently. And so, uh, but learning from it is what we want to do. So um, that's what I'd say to that. Bill, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I think just to be mindful of um, everyone's time, we're going to probably wrap up pretty soon, but I would love to hear just like, what is one piece of advice that you would give to all of us as Terry students, um, I guess on this call, probably interested in a career in real estate, would love to hear from you on that before we leave. So look, I'd say never give up. Um, if, so use your connections, use your network to further your network, right? But the no, you gotta turn into a yes. You gotta, and, and you do that with respect and diligence, whatever. Hard work, I'll hire somebody who's a hard worker over somebody who's got a genius IQ, right? I mean, hard work wins the day. Uh, being prepared, demonstrating it though is, in, is important. So look, it, it's hard to get a job. It's always been hard to get a job and it's really hard to get the right job, um, especially when you don't know if you wanna do it or not, right? But I think going after that job, you gotta be, I, I worked, I had the, the fortunate, the, pleasure of working for a uh, city court judge when I was uh, summers uh, uh, off at, uh, when I was in college. And uh, he was a criminal judge. Sometimes these people would come in and he'd say, okay, here's the sentence, blah, blah, blah. And you got to get a job. And he, the judge's advice for the, and so do you understand what that means? And the defendant would look kind of confused. He goes, that means you're going to work like you have a job getting a job. Getting a job is a job. And that's, you know, nine in the morning to five at night. And so, you know, you got to work hard at getting a job and no different here. You're obviously not criminal defendants. So, uh, but you got to put in the time and you got to put in the research and uh, you got to work at it and you got to turn no's into yeses. And, uh, but, but again, it's, it's, it's built on network. Um, you know, people will help you. If you've got kind of a, a sound, rational approach to this thing, people will help you. I can't tell you. How many uh, young people, and my door is always open here. Who am I to not let somebody come in and give them advice? I'm happy to do it um, because, you know, I, I wish there was a me when I was, you know, looking to get into this just for some, some great advice about things. Um, so they, my door is open. So my, uh, my assistant usually tortures the people who live in Bronxville where I am, but uh, she's also from Alabama, so she might give you a hard time, but, you know, there's one call you have to make, and then, you know, if you're up in New York, my door is always open. We'll figure out a way to get you in or call or whatever. But uh, use me as a resource. Happy to do it. Love Georgia, University of, and love real estate. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and just for everything that you've shared with us, it's been really great to hear your perspective. Um, so with that, I think we are about out of time. But um, just want to say thank you to everyone on this call. And hopefully we can all stay in touch. I appreciate it. It was great to spend time with you. Thank you. Thanks for setting it up and have a great day. Right. Go dogs. Go dogs. Go dogs. Go dogs. Thank you.